let us all bow our heads for a moment. Our Father, we come before you today with a grateful and humble heart for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, for putting us, putting your arms around us, putting your arms around our families. And Lord, in sincerity, we ask your blessings upon this program, upon our speakers, our participants, and upon Ed and Pat. Thank you again, Lord, for gathering all of us here today for this event and giving us an opportunity once again to be in your holy presence. Bless us now, Lord. We give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're Ed and Pat Sanders, founders of 50 Hoops, and we want to welcome you to the premiere of the 2022 50 Hoops Legends Lecture Series. This year, the legends are on a quest like none before them. The lecture series this year is also an introduction to an important topic on the lips and websites in emails and banners for corporate participation. What is it? Diversity and inclusion. This year, the legends will give you a taste of what they can do in presenting the 10 commandments for recruiting African-Americans into clinical trials. Legend Valerie Worthy kicked it off with triple negative breast cancer and clinical trials importance and solution. And today, Cassandra Harris is taking it further up the mountain, joining MD Anderson with Baylor and other wonderful institutions with the question, are you a spectator? or a participator. This year, you'll hear the software and hardware of each legend as they begin their new legends journey in 2022. Cassandra Harris, here's the software. Legend Cassandra is a cons consummate professional. She's solution oriented. She has power and she knows how to use that power for good. Why? because she's always positive about that next step, that next test in life, both professionally and personally. A hidden nugget about Cassandra that is that she has a hilarious sense of humor. She can suddenly look at a very testy situation and say the funniest things, then end it with something like, God bless us all, let's keep it moving. She's also a masterful networker. Cassandra's blessing to others is her light that she shares with those around her and gets her mission done through many cancer initiatives and stakeholders throughout the United States. And I say to Cassandra to paraphrase Malachi 310, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you, an overflowing blessing. And now for the hardware. Legend Cassandra Harris is currently co-chair and has been a dedicated leader both within and without the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer, NBLIC. NBLIC conducts planning, development, and implements cancer awareness activities in Black communities throughout the nation. Her life resonates their goal to reduce cancer incidence and mortality rates, increase survival rates, address risk factors, and improve screening use and early detection rates within the U.S. With over three decades of experience in planning health education programs and helping to reduce the impact of cancer on our Black community, Cassandra is currently the Manager of Health Education Research at MD Anderson. Now, Cassandra, it's your show. All right. <laughs> Pat and Ed, y'all know how to motivate people. You have motivated me today. Thank you for allowing me to be a small part of your big vision. Welcome to the second lesson, Legends Lecture Series for June. The purpose of this session is to provide opportunities for individuals to become active participants in reducing cancer disparities. 
Today, you'll have two segments to partake in. The first section is Dr. Loveford from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and she'll talk about multiple myeloma. And this is a cancer that we don't know a lot about. Following her talk is Mr. Byron Daly from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And he will share how to collaborate with his organizations to educate faith community and also talk about some resources available to us. Then I thought about traditional health education approaches that move the community from education to action. Traditional education approaches are a thing in the past. In our second segment, Baylor College of Medicine, Daniel Duncan Cancer Center's theater outreach program will present a unique approach to educate African-Americans about clinical trials. And that session following the monologue, Dr. Rain Royce will talk about why it is extremely important for us to ensure that research benefits our community. Then at the closing, I'll leave you with a call to action to partake in the information that was presented to you today. And then we'll have a special guest, Dima Hakim. We'll talk about information to connect communities to research. They have a unique new program that's free and available to all of us. Take it away. Dr. Leffert. Oh, sorry, I was muted. I'm sorry. Okay, are you are are you able to hear me? We can hear you. You're good. Okay. Thank you so thank you so much for inviting me um, to this series and to um, be able to share with the, the group and the community today. It really is an honor and a privilege to take part. Um, the reason why I went into medicine and why I went into oncology was because of an interest in re reducing disparities in our communities. And so um, it gives me great joy to be part of this, um, this effort. Um, I, I will qualify by saying that. So I'm a, an assistant professor at uh, MD Anderson in the general oncology and the GI medical oncology departments. And so I mostly see patients with solid cancers. So not, not multiple myeloma and actually I, I had was under the impression that we were going to talk about blood cancers in general and so had prepared for that. So I'll you'll probably hear a little bit more than multiple myeloma, but I'll try to be brief because I think the issues are are go across all disease types in terms of the the challenges that we face with um, with with multiple myeloma and other blood cancers. So we can move on to the next slide. So blood cancers in general are different from solid cancers. So when we think of solid cancers, we think of the liver, we think of the colon, we think of the brain, any organ in the body, uh, a cancer can develop there. Blood cancers are a little bit more nebulous. They, um, they, they are cancers that essentially are circulating in the bloods or, or component in the blood or components that have to do with the blood, components of the body that have to do with the blood. So the bone marrow, the middle of the bones, that's the, that's the factory for all the blood cells, all the, the, can, the cells that circulate in the body. So in, it, you see in this diagram in the middle, there is the, um, the bone. Um, and in the middle, you have stem cells. These are stem cells that have the potential to become any kind of blood cell. And they um, form red cells, which take oxygen around your body. They form platelets, which are fragments of cells, which prevent you from bleeding if you have an injury. And then you have white cells that pr protect you um, from infection. So blood cancers are cancers in any component of this system uh, in the body. Ne next slide. The most common types of blood cancers are leukemias, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma. And we'll talk very briefly about each of these. Next slide. So a uh, leukemia is a, a cancer that um, starts off because the, the cells in the bone marrow that make the white cells are abnormal. So um, the cells, instead of growing and dying as cells normally should, 
they just continue to grow rapidly um, without knowing how to die, and then they enter the blood. Um, sometimes they can grow very slowly, um, but more often, they, more, more often they grow very quickly, and these we call acute leukemias. You can, next slide, please. So that's one cell normally that's supposed to grow and divide normally, and you can go to the next and the next. And, but they just keep growing rapidly. So you can see how quickly they grow. Um, go ahead, next slide. And so leukemias, um, when they grow this quickly, they take over the bone marrow. So the bone marrow, that's the middle of the bone, isn't able to produce the cells that it normally would make. So it cannot produce the red cells as well. It cannot produce the platelets as well. It cannot produce the white cells as well. So the symptoms that you get from this are because of that. So when the red cell count is low because the red cells can't be made because of these cells crowding the bone marrow, you get anemia. So that feels like tiredness, shortness of breath, um, chest pain. If the platelets are low because there's no space for platelets to be made, then there is a risk for easy bleeding, bruising very quickly or bleeding when it, whenever uh, someone has an injury. Next slide. The white cells, when they're low, um, that puts someone at risk for infection. So these are some of the most common symptoms that are associated with a leukemia. There are many other diseases that can cause these symptoms, but people with leukemia tend to have all these symptoms. Next slide. Um, so a lymphoma is different from a leukemia, but it's also another blood cancer. And it's a cancer of the, the, some of the white cells that are called lymphocytes, which are usually cells that fight infections in the body. Um, the lymphocytes continue to grow they, uh, and they grow um, uncontrollably. Um, and then they collect in the lymph nodes in the body. So if you think about your tonsils, though the tonsils have lymph node cells. So whenever you have a sore throat, for instance, and you feel that your tonsils are enlarged, that's because that's a lymph node area. Um, and so you, that's not the only lymph node area. You have lymph nodes throughout the entire body. And the, in the green on the right, in the person on, in, on the right, where you see all those green areas, that's where we have lymph nodes distributed through, uh, throughout the body. And so lymphomas can grow. These are the, the, the white blood cells that help us fight infection, can grow in any of these nodes all throughout the body. Um, and so the symptoms that come with that usually include swollen lymph node glands, um, fever, uh, weight loss, night sweats are some of the most common signs of lymphoma. Other things can cause this, but patients with lymphoma often come report this as well. And then lastly, uh, the next one is multiple myeloma. So this is another type of blood cancer um, and it's a cancer of plasma cells. So plasma cells are um, white cells that uh, are in the bone marrow and they make proteins to help fight infection. The cells grow really fast in multiple myeloma, these cells that normally would make the proteins and they make an abnormal amount of proteins and these proteins can damage um, different organs in the body. We use the mnemonic of CRAB to talk about what the symptoms from multiple myeloma usually look like. So high calcium, high calcium can lead to constipation, abdominal pain, it can cause renal dysfunction or kidney injury, it can cause anemia, and it can cause bone spots, painful bone areas where the myeloma is, is taking hold. Next slide, please. So the treatment for blood cancers usually involve, um, for the most part, chemotherapies or targeted therapies that treat specific changes in the cancer that are unique to an individual. Um, more recently, we have been incorporating immunotherapies as well into the care for blood cancers. Um, and the hallmark for many of these cancers that will allow people to be cured from the cancer are, is stem cell transplantation. Not for every blood cancer, but for, for, for majority, for multiple myeloma, stem cell is a standard of care and is a part of lengthening life um, for, for as a part, like an important step for treatment. In some lymphomas, we also use radiation. Next slide. 
Um, so we see a huge amount of cancer disparities in blood cancers. Um, disparities in general, we, we, we consider these differences in either the amount of people who get the cancer, how many people die from the cancer or have complications from the cancer, the differences that we see in different population groups. Next. Um, Blacks, African-Americans have the lowest survival rates across all ages and all types of, um, not just leukemias, but also other blood cancers as well. You can go to the next slide. And this is a graph that now that I'm looking at it on my phone, I realize it's hard to see. Next slide. But it highlights here that the survival at five years, the amount of people who are alive at five years, when you look at specifically at black patients, you can see that the number is lower. So for Hodgkin's lymphoma, for instance, that's the one on the very top, NHL, 59% of black patients are alive at five years compared to 69% of white patients. When you go to multiple myeloma, um, you see that 43% um, of black patients are alive at five years compared to 46% of white patients. And the list goes on and on, but the, the numbers are always lower for black patients. Next, please. And you can see here, black is in blue. And this is the amount of people who are um, also uh, looking at the amount of people who are alive at five years after diagnosis of a leukemia. And you can see in blue, the black patients, that's the lowest group, lowest amount of survival for all age groups, over 40 and below 40. Next slide. Um, we also are diagnosed at later stages with many of these types of cancers compared to other groups. So I'll just, this one shows lymphoma here, but this goes across the board for myeloma as well. So you can see that, for instance, among Caucasians, 30%, that's the number, stage one. And then if you look across 30%, 30.5% diagnosed at stage one versus 33% diagnosed at stage four. But when you go to black patients, you see that only 22% are diagnosed as stage one and 38, almost 40% are diagnosed as stage four. So we're diagnosed at later stages and later stage usually means more like worse outcomes. Next slide. Um, and then lastly, stem cell I mentioned is a key, um, a key treatment modality for, um, for blood cancers and um, black patients here shown in orange have um, the lowest rate of stem cell transplant. Um, and this is the, the same for multiple myeloma as well as leukemia, as well as um, lymphomas. So this is a key life-saving or life-prolonging treatment. Um, and we have the lowest numbers. Next slide. Um, and then to go to clinical trials, because I know this group is, is, is focused on clinical trials today. Um, of all the clinical trials, that included patients where race was reported for the previous 10 years between 2008 and 2018 that led to FDA approval of drugs. So there were 70,000 um, patients where race was reported. And as you can see, the number of patients who were Black among the clinical trials is really low, 1,500 out of 70,000 people in all these clinical trials. So we are not represented in clinical trials and clinical trials is where new developments in medicine take place, where exciting new drugs are kind of created and tried and, and um, help to impact and prolong life. Next slide, please. And so I just wanted to use this last slide to show that there are many reasons for disparities in cancers. It's there are biological factors, there, uh, there are individual factors, how, the, how much disease, other disease apart from cancer someone has, there are structural um, barriers, but also there are health related barriers. And one of those key areas is in the enrollment in clinical trials. We, um, don't, we don't enroll in clinical trials enough and so are not deriving the benefit from clinical trials enough. And that's why it gives me so much um, pleasure to know that a group like 50 Hoops is, is doing this kind of community outreach, reaching um, others to be able to enlighten them and share knowledge that will help to improve outcomes overall. So that, that ends my part. I'm here to answer any questions or um, you can put them in the chat or if we're pressed for time, I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Well, if no questions, then we could move on to the next section.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lofer. Um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. You can also use the Q&A as well. So our next section will actually feature uh, Hector Sanchez with Baylor College of Medicine. So what I will do is I will actually pull your slides up now, Hector, and I will let you take it on. Perfect, thanks so much. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending what a part of the country you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Hector Sanchez, and I'm accompanied by Dr. Lisa Rangel and Dr. Rain Rouse. We are from the Daniel Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center at Baylor College of Medicine, and today we bring you the clinical trials monologue and Q&A session. So Dr. Lisa Rangel and I work um, under the community outreach and engagement um, at the Cancer Center, and today we bring you the theater outreach program. Um, a little bit about our program. Our program works with um, local playwrights to develop culturally and linguistically appropriate full-length plays and monologues for minorities communities in Houston, Harris County, and surrounding areas. These monologues raise awareness about cancer screening and early detection for most common cancers, such as colorectal, cervical, and breast, as well as HPV vaccination and clinical trials participation. And so today we bring you um, our clinical trials participation monologue called A Win-Win for Everyone. So we really hope you enjoy it. Darrell, you got to hear this. So this morning, when I was walking to the Domino game at the center, I saw a funny looking flyer. At first, I thought it was for free stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm a sucker for free stuff. But when I read it closer, it was for something called a clinical trial. Uh, it's some kind of exercise study that the college is doing. Exactly, because I've been trying to get back into exercising. My daughter Lauren stays on my case lately to take my health more seriously. She keeps telling me that she sees all these unhealthy people as a nurse at the hospital, and she doesn't want me to end up like them. She says not managing some important aspect of your health, like blood sugar, cholesterol, smoking, or being overweight, can lead to some scary stuff. I mean, you can get diabetes, heart disease, or cancer more easily if you don't take care of yourself. So you know I've been trying to get back in the shape. I was curious if this clinical trial was a good opportunity. I brought it up with Lauren when she called this afternoon. Apparently, there's a lot of these clinical trials that help make better treatments for people with various illnesses or people who just want to improve their health like you and me. She was really excited about it and thinks it might help me get motivated. Now, I know I need to get serious about this, so I thought it might be fun if we both signed up. But that way we can do the program together. Well. That's what I asked Lauren. What would I really be signing myself up for? She explained it. It's pretty simple. During the study, they would pay for doctor visits and special training. She also says it's a good way to get testing done for free. <laughs> I mean, they'll watch your blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, 
And it might even help you get healthier too. All we got to do is show up to our appointments and classes. Lauren said the doctor will explain everything we're going to do in the study before we start. And we can ask questions if we have any concerns. And even if we sign up today and end up not liking it, we can leave at any time. Now, I know what your suspicious self is thinking. Oh, these things are always controlled by the government. They just want to get our information. But Lauren told me that the college can only keep information about the trial. They can't share it with anybody. They don't use our real names. Our personal information. They can only use information to show them if the trial is helping us get healthier. Now, I was surprised and that shocked that Jimmy Earl always takes part in flu vaccine trials. He said the researchers were nice and they never ever shared his information and they always kept him informed about all his results. Now Lauren also told me not many black folks join these trials. Well, she said black folks, a lot of them are scared to participate in clinical trials because they think the researchers are going to use this as guinea pigs. And that's not good. Well, because doctors need to know how things affect African Americans. But they need to know what works for us so they can provide us the proper care. Times have changed. Research today is not like the Tuskegee experiment. There are restrictions in place to protect participants, especially their privacy. They never ever said Jimmy Earl's information. And Lauren told me they have people in place whose only job is to see that all rules are followed. And on top of all of that, we can have access to programs and medicines that may improve our lives before everyone else even hears about them. So, yeah, it sounds like a win-win for everyone. But so what do you say? You on board? Great. Great. I'll give them a call and find out how to get signed up. I'll talk to you later, Daryl. <laughs>
why African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans may feel extremely uncomfortable about even exploring the concept of participating in a clinical trial. I grew up hearing that. One of my mother's best friends had participated in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And so from a, the time that I was a very young child, it was at the forefront of my mind that perhaps I couldn't trust the healthcare system. So I grew up with this, right? And now I am a physician and not only am I a physician taking care of children with very different difficult to treat cancers, but I'm also a scientist and I lead clinical trials, usually of things that have never been tested before in human beings. So like we heard about earlier, how we're moving the forefront of cancer therapy and looking at more personalized and targeted treatments where we can literally even help use the patient's immune system them to target their cancer. That's the type of work that I do. And when I first entered the lab working on these types of fancy immune therapies where I could genetically modify a cell, the first thing that I thought of was, wow, I'm really going to have to make sure that when I'm approaching families, when I'm approaching patients, when I'm explaining what I do to my, my own mom, my own cousins and my family members, that I help them understand for, from the beginning the various safeguards that are in place to ensure that we are safely testing these new and potentially very promising therapies on patients and also help them understand the potential benefits, but the risks, okay? So one of the most important things about healthcare and about clinical trials in general, regardless of whether you're participating in a clinical trial, like the one we heard about on that amazing skit, which I've seen so many times and every single time I, I, I still enjoy it just as much as the first time, is that if you're participating in a clinical trial that may be about, uh, that's not what we call interventional, where it's you doing some sort of activity or whether it's monitoring your blood and you're not necessarily getting a new drug or whether you're participating in a clinical trial that's testing a combination of medicines that's never been tested before in humans, you still receive informed consent which means that you are talked to about the safeguards in place, you are talked to about exactly what is going to occur, how will this disrupt your schedule and your life, how, um, will, how would this compare to what the standard would be, right? If you weren't participating in the clinical trial but you're tre being treated for breast cancer, how does the treatment differ? These are all important things that you need, not just the potential side effects, but you need to understand, will this therapy be available for you in the long term. And so one of the most important things that I think we can underscore is the fact that we understand we need to better inform our patients, our communities, and their families, and that's everyone's responsibility. And so I'll stop there, um, and I just I want to make sure that we have time to answer any questions that may have come up um, and even if any of anyone else wants to, to chime in, because I could talk about this all day long. And I love in the chat, I'm seeing that change happens is distributing free at home colorectal cancer screening. There are so many wonderful organizations that whose sole purpose is to, to ensure that everyone has access to cancer screening materials, that everyone has the information that they need to make decisions about their treatment, that um, physicians like myself and, and Dr. Lefford are involved in actually treating patients that look like us and demystifying the clinical trials process, but also, frankly, addressing some of the historical reasons that we may not feel comfortable participating in trials. Let's see. So if we, Terrence, you you tell me if there's questions, and you yes, tell me if we need to move at. on. But you know, I you know I you know I can fill up some time. Oh no, I know <laughs> we still have time. Um, I think Cassandra has rejoined us, but uh, I think. Um, but if people have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. And I can absolutely just say a, a couple more things. So one thing that I do in my daily practice when I'm approaching families uh, who are thinking about enrolling their child on a clinical trial, or when I'm talking to a teenager or a young adult, because I do take care of young adults as well, is I 
approach the situation where I think about every single possible thing that I would want to know if someone was approaching me about a clinical trial. And I think it's really important for people to be empowered and understand that when you ask the question like, how does this compare to this? Or why do you, doctor, tell me why you think this would be potentially beneficial to me? There used to be this kind of thought that you were challenging the healthcare system. That's not challenging. People should be prepared to answer these questions. So if you ever are in a situation where you're being approached about a clinical trial and that particular person who's approaching you can't answer that question, I promise you there are other people that can answer that question. And sometimes you feel like you may be in a situation where an answer is needed immediately and that may not work for you. Your healthcare team, your patient navigators, they can help you understand when it may be worthwhile to take a little bit of time to think about something or even engage other trusted individuals to hear more about the opportunities that you have to participate in clinical trials. One thing I'll say is all of us, um, who are cancer doctors or any sort of healthcare professional, we want to make sure that we are represented because if we do not have these really exciting and potentially less toxic drugs tested in our population, how will we move forward? I love to see a news flash that says there was an 85% response rate in 500 patients. And then I get so sad when I see that only 3% of those patients were African-American and 6% were Hispanic and none were Native American. And that's not because these cancers or diseases do not exist in these populations. That's because for various reasons, which we've been talking about in the chat, it's not just lack of education about the potential benefit, it's the logistical barriers, it's the insurance, it's the implicit bias that researchers and clinicians can actually have and say, you know what, I know that they may have some misconceptions, so I'm not going to push on this because I don't want to pressure because in my experience, you know, Black people don't typically want to enroll. That's not okay, right? So we should have access to the same opportunities and access to the ability to have informed consent and, and truly make the decisions that are best for ourselves and for our families. And you actually just answered a question that was sent to me directly, which was about education. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Another question actually asked about compensation for clinical yeah. trials, and they want to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So I am on the the what's called the institutional review board, which is basically at every single institution that does any sort of human research, there is a board of individuals that are made up not just of doctors and nurses and researchers, but also of uninvolved community partners of patient advocates. And their sole job is to ensure that um, patient safety is paramount and also to ensure just the integrity of clinical trials. And so one thing is that you'll find that if there is a trial that is not an intervention that is specifically treating your cancer, for example, if it's saying we would like you to participate in this sleep study trial because we're trying to better understand this or we're trying to better understand exercise patterns, what you will often find is that there will be some form of compensation because it's compensating the time that you are spending and contributing. You won't necessarily find that in all trials that are treating an actual disease because the, the purpose of that interventional trial is also specifically to treat a disease. And so there, there are strict guidelines about compensation. That being said, if the standard of care is to come once a week for therapy and the trial wants you to come three times a week because you're gonna have some extra blood drawn and you're gonna do some extra uh, surveys about your quality of life, clinical trials from, from conception should be thinking about how are we going to ensure that this is not extremely disruptive? Do we have the ability to loop in social workers if we can't directly compensate? Do we have the ability to help with parking and with gas? And so one of the things that I advocate for, for as someone who literally works on science at the bench in the laboratory and then brings it to the clinic and then takes care of those patients is that when we're designing our mouse experiments, I'm thinking about 
we need to have the social worker in the room. We need to talk to LLS. We need to talk to the patient navigators because while I may think that coming three times a week is not a big deal, it's a huge deal for people. And, and part of it is diversifying the people who are making these decisions and it not always being people who would not think twice about coming three times a week because they have a nanny and, you know, multiple means to be able to do that. But it's a huge deal and we recognize it. Um, and I, I think part of events like this and organizations like this and bringing us all together is ensuring that we're not recognizing that as an afterthought all the time, right? When we look at the first 20 patients enrolled on a trial and we say, hmm, I wonder why we don't have anyone who's representative from these demographics or from these zip codes. You know, that's something that we have to think about. It's something we have to educate pharmaceutical companies about. It's something we have to educate um, everyone involved about. And so speak up and ask and, and, and don't be, uh, you know, shy about asking because we recognize the inconvenience. Even when there is a potential benefit for you, that does not change the fact that there may be additional inconvenience um, and cost related to participation. I do have one more question that came. Um, they sent it anonymous, anonymous, anonymously, forgive me. Um, they want to know, so do I automatically qualify for a clinical trial once I'm diagnosed with cancer? That is a really, really, really good question. Um, and the answer is this. There are tons of uh, different types of cancers, and there are cancers where we have a, what we call a standard of care, where we know from years and years of prior research that the best chance for us to cure that specific cancer is a certain uh, type of treatment. There are also, for those very same cancers, where we say, you know what, we've done really well with this cancer, we can cure 80% of people, but we want to get to 100%. We wonder if the addition of this medication or of this radiation therapy, we wonder if this can improve the outcomes. So what that means is that for the vast majority of cancers, there are clinical trials that you may be eligible for. However, your doctor and your healthcare team should help you understand what the standard of care is, and then from there, what are other potential treatment options and why your participation in a clinical trial may be beneficial, okay? Does that make sense? Um, and so what that means is that we always are patient-minded. We're going to do what's best for you and what's evidence-based. There may be times where there's the opportunity for a clinical trial, and this happens frequently, where we say, you know, like I said this this morning to a patient's family, um, the most likely thing is that we're, we'll cure your cancer, and this, this therapy that, that we is standard of care is, has probably about a 90 to 95% chance there is an additional clinical trial that's available that's testing a drug that really has been shown to be safe in adults and has been shown to have some benefit. We're not sure if this drug will have the same benefit in children and in your child, and we're, we're not sure if it will change the outcome. However, from the evidence that is available from earlier clinical trials, I do not see specific safety concerns that would make me think that the addition would be harmful. And I do see that there's the potential that it could be beneficial. And so I wanted to let you know this because the most important thing for me is to treat your child and to cure them. But I also want you to understand all of the options available. And I wanna do my very best to explain these options so that together we can come to a decision about what's best for your child right now. And then we have two more questions in the Q&A. One basically states, how can organizations advocate so that more Blacks are included and are being considered essential when it comes to clinical trials? Well, I think step one is being present at events like this, right? So at this event, we're fortunate. We, you know, we're here in the Texas Medical Center and we have the ability to have all of these amazing 
uh, doctors and institutions and community organizations. So just you being here, call yourself out in the chat. I, I love that people are doing that because what it helps us do is it helps us say, you know what, I remember that organization from 50 Hoops and we're specifically looking at our catchment area and we're looking at how we can enhance diversity. We think we have a good idea of how to do that and we, we have these programs in place, but I wonder if partnering with this institution uh, or, or this organization will help us to have a greater reach within the community. And then someone else wants to know, are there metrics available to determine the demographics of people who have been approached about clinical trials? There, you know, that is just such an, that is such a good question um, because we know so that there are some published reports that mostly rely on surveys to look at practices of physicians or uh, clinical trial um, uh, in investigators and how they approach people, but there is a bit of a gap when you could, because it looks at your practices and, and what your approach is and you can, you know, you can guess from that or extrapolate that they may be less likely to approach certain people. Um, but institutionally, there are uh, almost, I, I feel like lists of this person was approached. So people do have that information. The, part of the issue is the, the reasons for why people may not agree to participate in the clinical trial can vary widely, whether this is due to a medical reason, an eligibility reason, or something that the uh, person that you uh, approached did not even reveal to the investigator. So we need to do more um, research in that area. And for now, we kind of have to use various areas of research to extrapolate, but that's something that I personally am, am, am very interested in. And so I know we have one more presenter. I'm not certain if Cassandra is back. Uh, yes, I'm back. Okay. Is do you see if um, Demma Hykem is on? Yes, yeah, she's, yes. she's on. She's yeah. here. <laughs> okay, I would like for her to just tell us a few minutes. Tell us a little bit about her program um, and how we can get involved. Sure. Thank you, um, Cassandra, for the invitation and my sincere apologies that I wasn't able to join you all for the full hour. Um, I had another meeting, but um, I'm sure it was fantastic and I'm looking forward to watching the recording. Um, but Cassandra invited me to share a little bit about um, one of the things that our program offers for community interested in being involved in research. And so I'll start off by saying, um, my name's Dima Hakim. I'm the program manager of the um, community engagement program at Boston University CTSI, which is um, the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Um, Cassandra, it looks like I am not able to share my screen. Try now and see if it works. Uh, it says it's disabled. I could, um, should I send it to you quickly? Or maybe I can put the file in the chat or. Let me see. You can send it and we can always send it out afterwards and that way they'll have the visual. Okay, great. So maybe I will just talk through it then. Um, let me pull up what I have. Okay, so um, our program, the Community Engagement Program at Boston University, we're excited to share um, what we have called Communities Connecting to Research. It's a free and self-paced online training about community research partnership. Um, and it's been developed specifically for communities. So other types of um, research trainings are traditionally developed for um, more academic researchers and people that kind of work in the institution. So this is, our goal was really to develop it for community members who are interested in working um, in research. 
Um, so users of the module can start the training at any time. And um, if you leave, you're able to come back to the same place that you left off. Um, this version of the module is actually adapted from a previous version that we had that was more of a toolkit. Um, and we did that, our program had developed that with funding from PCORI, which is an institution that focuses on research that's centered around patients. Um, this online version is taught by two members of our community engagement program who are also, um, they also teach at the Boston University School of Social Work. Their names are Linda Sprague Martinez and Deborah Chasler. Um, and Linda and Deborah take the users through a few different topics related to community research, which include the history of research harms in community. Um, they go over a review of the research process. Um, they go through the benefits of community engaged research. Um, they review different roles that community partners can have in research. And they also help go through the planning and preparation for community academic partnerships in research. And I'll put a little, um, I'll put some links in the chat, but the, the Communities Connecting to Research module is available on our website um, right now. And you can, like I said, use it at any time. Um, some, of the, some of the links I'll include are directly to the module. There's a link to our website. And then I'll also include my email in there um, in case you have any questions about the training or our program. Um, I'll also note that the registration for the module is in two different steps, um, just by the way that the, the system was kind of built. Um, so we really appreciate your patience as you go through the steps to register. And we hope that the training would be insightful and helpful um, to you. And as kind of a recognition of the work that you will put into this training, um, all users will receive a certificate of completion at the conclusion of the training. Um, so I'm sorry I wasn't able to share the slides, but um, like Terrence said, um, I'll share them with him and then um, hopefully they'll be distributed to you all. Um, I'm gonna put the links in now and those should be there for you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm, I'm looking forward to the recording. Thank you. And so I know we've come to the top of the hour. I don't know if Cassandra wants to close this out. Or, okay. Yeah. So sorry, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And again, thanks to Pat and Ed for entrusting me with their vision. We've had some a wealth of information today by our speakers. Um, I hope you enjoyed the win-win monologue by Baylor College of Medicine. Um, they have tons of monologues that you can use and educate the community with. Doc, thank you to Dr. Royce Rouse and thank you to um, Dr. Loveford and all of our partners and speakers today. And thank you to Demma and her sharing her information. I thought that was a great program. And you know, uh, many of us, there's so much out there, we don't know about all those resources. So if we can find things and share it with each other, uh, I think we can educate as many people as possible and then increase those rates. The title again was be a participator, not a spectator. So I encourage all of you to be a participator and not a spectator when it comes to health disparities and clinical trials. And uh, with this information, I'd like to just leave you with those thoughts and I'll turn it back over to Pat and Ed if they have any thoughts or last, last words. words. We have a, we want you to pick a person, Cassandra. We have a $50 gift card to give to someone. We want you to pick that person for us. You want me to do it now? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, let, me, <laughs> let me look at the, the list. list. Okay. okay, let's, let's see. see. And I'm, I'm on, on my phone, so I can't get to everybody. Okay, okay. Is, there is there anybody that's having a birthday, birthday in July? In July? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good way to do it. <laughs> oh, right. 
Raise, raise your hand. hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> Did we Did see anyone? see anyone? I didn't see anybody. Okay. We have Linda Giddings. Linda, Linda, Giddings. Linda Giddings. We want Pastor Singleton to close us out too. Thank you. Linda. Send, send us information on Linda, if you could, Cassandra, and we'll um, get her address and get her out this information. Uh -huh. All right, I have, I have it. it. Okay. Pastor, it's yours. All right. All right. Once again, Lord, we want to say thank you for blessing us again with an awesome program. Thank you for all the doctors, Lord, that, that gave us the knowledge, Lord, and Thank you for Terrence, Cassandra, uh, Hector, and Demer. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom and knowledge they continue to, to give us. Thank you for every participant uh, that came aboard uh, this afternoon. And we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to expand their territory for greatness. And Lord, once again, as we dismiss from this event, under no circumstance do we dismiss from your holy presence. Watch over us, lead and guide us, and we be mindful to thank you for everything you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone have a safe holiday.